I think we'll probably see a slashing incident in the next um, sort of 18 months uh, occur and that'll probably reframe the risk and reward curve for a lot of um, a lot of people that are engaging in the restaking space. Exactly what that looks like, I'm not so sure, but um, right now there's nothing really at stake because there's no slashing implemented within Eigenlayer. There's only incentives um, getting directed to, to people that are restaking. But um, once the reward's factored in, maybe people pull out of, of, of restaking due to the risk. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I anticipate that there'll be a reset when slashing gets introduced ultimately. Uh, so my name is Patrick McNabb. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Peer2. Uh, Peer2 is an institutional staking provider uh, based in Australia and we work with a lot of exchanges, funds, custody providers, wallets uh, in the APAC region. Can you provide an overview of uh, Peer2 and its core services? Sure. So. Peer2, uh, ultimately we're, we're a staking business, so um, we work with other businesses um, to access staking. So we run all of the validator infrastructure that enables exchanges, funds, custody providers to access staking rewards for them and, and their clients ultimately. Um, so Peer2 plays the role of basically holding their hand uh, into staking uh, running the validators and uh, earning, earning them rewards. We're here at EEA Day in Bangkok. Can you tell us what brings you specifically to this event? Because there's like 900 other side events happening this week. Why pick this one over the other events? Yeah, so the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, Peer2, we've, we've been engaged uh, with, uh, with the team um, in more recent history, but uh, it's a fantastic way of connecting with enterprise and, and, uh, and more traditional industry players that are looking at applying blockchain to their business and uh, looking at crypto uh, as a means of, um, of, of the future, I suppose. Um, so the EEA provides an awesome outlet to connect with those people uh, and um, peer to our business. So um, we're, looking for, uh, we're looking for institutions and, and enterprises that are um, going to be engaging with the crypto ecosystem so that we can support them with staking uh, because ultimately we believe that uh, a lot of people will, will continue to stake and um, the growth of the staking market uh, just, just shows that, I suppose. And uh, you've been a member of EEA uh, for some time now. What can you share about your... Uh experience and uh, what can you say sh um, say about the uh, motivation behind joining EEA as a member? Yeah, so we get global, global uh, coverage uh, in terms of you join the group and there's members from all around the world uh, that you can connect with. Uh, the EEA are consistently engaging in research topics, um, in market research that they can present to, to their industry members ultimately. Um, and yeah, I think that the value that we get is from tapping into that network. Um, there's a, the, the, the community is becoming more vibrant, I'd say as well, uh, which is great. So it's good to see that. What staking services does uh, Peer2 offer and how does it differentiate from others in the market? Sure, so Peer2 offers a non-custodial staking service um, for enterprises. So. Um, what that means is that uh, we run the validators for clients and they maintain custody of their assets and the rewards at all points in time. Uh, in terms of how that differs from the market offering today, uh, there are a lot of other staking businesses, uh, but Peer2, we're here in APAC, um, this is where we're based, and uh, we work with businesses in this region from a time zone alignment perspective. and. Um, Staking can be a scary thing at first for, for some businesses and people uh, that are looking to engage. Um, and we really hold people's hands uh, on, on that journey and um, yeah, make sure that they're aware of all of the, the risks and, and rewards of staking. Um, but how it would differ from something like Lido, which people might be a lot more familiar with, is um, Peer2 actually runs validators for Lido. Um, so we're in the background uh, as a validator infrastructure and we work with groups that are looking to, to uh, validate the chain and, and earn block rewards. So how do you engage with clients to ensure they receive optimal stake in rewards and security? Uh, how we engage with them, um, thankfully with Ethereum, everything is on chain. Um, so what we can do is 
we can very easily point to things like Rated, uh, which is an Ethereum validator um, rating system, uh, and it uh, can very easily show um, the performance of Peer2 in comparison with other operators and other staking providers in the market. So um, that's a very simple uh, way of explaining to our clients um, how we maximize their rewards. So Peer2 also received a grant from the Ethereum Foundation to develop a light clients. Uh, can you share details about this, uh, the production of light clients and how it has been to work with EF to receive the grant? Yeah, sure. So uh, Lantern is the name of our light client. Uh, we've de been developing that for the last 18 or so months. Um, and yeah, as you said, the Ethereum Foundation has supported uh, Peer 2's efforts with Lantern um, in just about that, that same period of time. Um, so Lantern is uh, a fully peer-to-peer -peer light client, uh, which means that um, uh, it connects directly with the Ethereum, uh, other Ethereum nodes. Uh, instead of other light clients today, uh, they rely on injections from RPCs. Uh, so. Um, yeah, we've been really focused on building and developing Lantern. Uh, today, uh, the use cases of light clients are somewhat limited, um, but when Verkle trees uh, get shipped uh, in the Verge um, for, for Ethereum's protocol upgrade in the future, um, that's when we're going to see light clients become a lot more relevant because they'll then be able to read and write natively um, to the blockchain itself. So instead of just verifying transactions uh, today um, and verifying state, uh, which is useful for things like bridges and, and L2s, uh, and if you want certainty from, uh, from viewing a transaction's validity, I suppose, um, but yeah, post the verge, ideally then, uh, as uh, Vitalik's been talking about and a lot of people have been talking about, we'll be able to have light clients natively within wallets, uh, within many devices that can very easily access Ethereum uh, without relying on an RPC. Yeah, let's talk about more of the uh, implications of, of light clients for the broader ecosystem. What, what do you, how do you anticipate uh, the light client development uh, benefiting the broader um, Ethereum ecosystem? Yeah, so there's a couple of uh, couple of angles, I guess. So, light clients, um, especially Lantern, because it doesn't rely on an RPC, are free. Uh, they're they're a free way of accessing Ethereum, uh, which is incredible. So I think what that means for um, say third world countries is uh, you could easily have a light client natively on your phone that's running. You don't have to pay for it, and you can use it to send money or, or do whatever you need to on Ethereum, uh, which, which I think is fantastic. On the other end of the spectrum, the applications, the wallets, um, the platforms that are running today, um, a lot of them rack up um, quite costly RPC bills, um, and um, the RPC connection being the way that they connect to uh, the blockchain. Um, the future of light clients looks like a way to reduce cost for a lot of these wallets um, and applications that currently 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 rely on uh, RPCs, um, and uh, they'll in the future be able to rely on light clients instead, which I think is really exciting. Being based in Australia, how does Peer2 view the Southeast Asian uh, blockchain landscape? Yeah, it's very vibrant, um, and. Uh, Southeast Asia is an amalgamation of a lot of different countries uh, with uh, their own language and their own culture. Uh, uh, so there's a, there's a lot of quirks to, to every different uh, jurisdiction and, and every different country. Um, but uh, it's very clear uh, it's very clear that there's increasing demand for uh, crypto generally um, here in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think a lot of the, the Asian countries were um, very fast adopters of, uh, of some mobile phone technology and um, getting online back, back in the day. And I think uh, we're seeing similar, um, similar things start to play out in Southeast Asia as well, which is pretty exciting. Looking forward, what are, the, uh, what are Peer 2's plans for the next year, especially uh, concerning staking services and the light client development? Sure. So, uh, we're going to keep staking uh, and uh, we're going to look to onboard more clients in the APAC region. 
Um, so for Ethereum staking specifically, uh, there's going to be some changes in the next 12 months with respect to the protocol. So uh, increasing the max effective balance of um, the amount of ETH that's staked on validators. So increasing that from, from 32 uh, up. So um, that's, that's a change to how staking is, uh, is structured um, ultimately that'll, that'll affect our business. But um, I think, yeah, we're just going to continue to, to work with institutions and exchanges and, and funds that do want to access staking and, and staking rewards uh, here in this region. Um, for Lantern, uh, we're going to continue development. Uh, we're going to continue talking to wallets and uh, L2s that, that may look to uh, integrate Lantern uh, over time um, and be building towards that world that is more of a light, light, light client-centric world. Um, instead of the pure RPC world that, that we mostly see today. And uh, how do you see the staking industry evolving and how do you think, uh, how will Peer2 play a, a role in that? Yeah, sure. So the staking industry broadly has just kept growing, I guess, since proof of stake was introduced. Um, outside of Ethereum, there's more and more layer one networks that, that are getting launched uh, as well. Um, where uh, staking is a, a relevant um, part of, of those networks. Uh, so um, what the future of staking looks like, uh, I think more and more people are going to continue to be staking. Um, and ultimately, uh, the chain will just become more and more secure uh, because of that as well. Um, so I don't think, uh, unless there's any uh, changes to the ETH issuance, uh, which there's some research going into that at the moment uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, I think uh, staking will just continue to grow um, as we've seen in the last year, two years, specifically on Ethereum. Fantastic. Do you have any uh, final words you'd like to share about EEA Day, being a member at EEA, or, um, or, or about Peer2 in general? No, just on the staking industry specifically, I guess, um, it's been interesting uh, observing the growth of restaking uh, as well. Like it's not, not just pure native staking that's occurring at the moment. Like we're getting into some relatively uncharted territory right now uh, with respect to the collateral that's getting staked, um, being able to use, be used to secure uh, other uh, services as well. Um, so, um, I think it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out in the next uh, 24, uh, sort of 36 months, um, and uh, which applications are actually tapping into that uh, that collateral, and um, if if restaking becomes a, a viable long-term um, model with people tapping into the existing crypto economic security of Ethereum. Um, so yeah, I think that that could be like a, a massive change in the way that people view pure ETH staking because the yields, if these services um, become relevant that are, that are tapping into the restaked security, um, the yields for staking uh, at the base rate may seem less attractive than restaked yields in the future as we're maybe already starting to see with things like Eigenlayer uh, coming out. Uh, what do you anticipate from this period? Actually, you said that it's a very it's, a, it's an uncharted territory, mm. and looking forward uh, over the next 12 months or even beyond that, uh, what do you anticipate will come out uh, out of this new experiment in uh, Ethereum? Yeah, so uh, I guess right now you've got ETH staking yields are about 3.2 thereabouts percent, uh, depending on the MEV for the day and the, the blocks for the day. Uh, but the Eigen native restaked yield right now uh, is approximately a bit more than 1% on top of that. So uh, when you're talking a, a lot of capital that's getting staked, um, that's a, it's a big difference. Um, so people are going to be attracted to that. Um, but I guess the, the concern is around slashing ultimately um, for uh, the different um, the different AVSs that are um, tapping into this restaked security. Um, so I think we'll probably see a slashing incident in the next um, sort of 18 months uh, occur, and that'll probably reframe the risk and reward curve for a lot of, um, 
a lot of people that are engaging in the restaking space. Exactly what that looks like, I'm not so sure, but um, right now there's nothing really at stake because there's no slashing implemented within Eigenlayer. There's only incentives um, getting directed to, to people that are restaking. But um, once the reward's factored in, maybe people pull out of, of, of restaking due to the risk. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I anticipate that there'll be a reset when slashing gets introduced ultimately. And what will be the outcome of that uh, reset, do you think? Um, well, right now there's like very immature security tooling and monitoring, alerting around uh, all of the AVSs uh, and, and, the, uh, and the, the staking ecosystem. So I'd say there'll be a lot more security tooling. Uh, there'll be a lot more um, emphasis placed on uh, I guess the same practices that we put into staking today, uh, the same security practices being applied uh, across the entirety of the restaking industry as well. Um, so yeah, I'd say that, that that'll be a big part of the, the reset. Um, but um, in terms of the flows of, uh, of restaking, they'll probably slow down a little bit after that, mm -hmm. uh, that point. Um, and people are probably jumping in without too many considerations of the the risks at the moment, well, there aren't any, but um, their capital is restaked now, and when they're introduced, they should absolutely be looking back at the, the, the risk of the networks. And uh, any final words you'd like to share about EEA as well, uh, as being a member for the past approximately year? Yeah, they're an awesome organization. <laughs> um, so I definitely advocate for uh, people that are looking to connect with global enterprise players, uh, to, to join up to the EEA. Uh, it's, uh, it's being run by a great team uh, and um, should join the ship. Fantastic. Well, uh, great to connect and chat with you. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, appreciate it.